Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll give folks maybe another moment to sign on and then we'll get started in just a moment. Just in the interest of time, I want to respect all of your time and thank you so much for signing on right at the, the top of the meeting time. Um, so today we are going to start our learning collaborative, getting to know each other and getting to see an overview of what we're hoping to do in the next nine months and then take a little bit of a dive into some of the overarching principles of our work together. And then we are going to have some time to think together about a, a student or a, a client or a case or an issue uh, that you all are, are facing right now and sort of brainstorm collaboratively together. I do welcome everyone who's able to turn your screens on so we can start seeing each other and getting to know each other. I know not everyone's able to do that and I welcome those of you who are. So we're just going to start by getting to know each other a little bit because we are in hoping to create this collaborative um, where we're really learning and growing together over the next school year. And so I invite everyone to do a little check-in. We have a, a fun check-in with the rubber ducky. So if you want to either annotate or put in the chat what number duck you feel like today. So if you see at the top, it says you are viewing Lauren Hack's screen, and then there's like a little options with arrows. You can click down on there and click annotate to either put like a stamp or your initials by one of the ducks. Um, I'm going to say I feel like four today, like maybe a little bit discombobulated with just trying to get everything up and running and still standing upright overall. Um, and then if everyone could put in the chat your name, your organization, and your school or school district, that would be great. We'll just give folks a, another moment or two to check in, sign on in. Um, it's great to see so many folks' roles and, and districts and uh, settings coming through the chat. Um, we're going to have, I think, a really nice group working together this year. Okay. So as I said today, we are going to look at what is this ECHO model and what are our goals together, have some Q&A. We'll do a brief didactic um, on the overarching principles, and then we'll dig right into the case-based learning. So Project ECHO was created um, actually in, in a rural state to provide hepatitis C care on par with academic specialists. And it has since really expanded to all sorts of different disciplines in the health and mental health and education setting. And the idea though, that the common thread in all of the Project Echoes is really hoping to take this, you know, specialized knowledge about a topic and share it with folks in the community doing the work and having us all come together and learn from one another. And so Project Echo has an all teach, all learn principle. We really think that the best way that we can reduce disparities is by sharing practices together and really working together to learn from cases that are happening right now. 
Um, and also developing this collaborative together where we're sharing not only knowledge, but also support, validation, kindness, and respect. Specifically for our school-based echo series today, these are some of the goals that we hope to cover. And because, um, because of time, I won't go into these too much because hopefully you saw these in our flyer and they're also up on our website. But how we're going to hope to accomplish these are by meeting together over the next nine months. And every time we meet together, the first half of the hour, we'll have a brief learning session on some sort of topic. And we also hope to give you hand up handouts and, and helpful takeaways. And then the second half of the hour will be consultation where we all kind of think together about a problem that one of us or, or a group of us is facing. And then we're also going to have an optional 15 minutes at the end for a little bit more interactive Q&A or role plays or practice for those of you who are able to stay on uh, 3.30 to 3.45. So here's a really brief look at our topics. Um, just a shout out for next month, we have working with newcomer youth. And then in November, we have uh, identifying and supporting students with anxiety. Really, we want these sessions to be as helpful as possible. So we're going to ask you to send us questions or, or specific topics within these areas that you'd really like addressed so that we can hopefully, you know, have the presenters bring the most relevant information as possible. So every month you'll you'll join the Tello Echo session on Zoom, just like you're doing now. We'll do brief announcements and check-ins. We'll have that brief learning didactic, the case consultation. And then we also have um, continuing education credits, and you're able to get those by filling out a brief survey at the end of every week. And then again, we'll have that optional Q&A time. So we'll meet every second Wednesday from 2.30 to 3.30. And every time uh, we will ask for someone to volunteer to talk about a case or an issue or a student um, that we can all brainstorm together. We hope that everyone can come regularly so we can develop that sense of communicate and participate as actively as possible. Um, and really, you know, this is a true collaborative. We're all learning from one another. Everyone is an expert in your own setting, and we're hoping to share kind of our tips and our expertise and our struggles together. So here's a look at our CAP Hub team who will be here. I think most of us are, are on this call today or will are not able to join the call today, but we'll be joining in the future sessions. I know that was rapid fire pace and any questions about the overarching echo structure and what we're hoping to do the next nine months. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our other hub members, uh, Petra Steinbuschel and Santoy Trotter to talk about our overarching principles. And we just want to state that there are no um, disclosures to report for this didactic. I think you're on mute, Santoy. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to say hello and welcome. My name is Santoy Trotter. I am the clinical director of our school-based behavioral health services at Children's Hospital Oakland and have the honor of working at Castlemont High School. And I see some folks uh, from Castlemont, uh, welcome, and also McClyman's High School. And um, really great to partner with many of the school-based health centers across the county. Um, I will be talking about and just doing a brief kind of overview of trauma-informed principles. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, we are all holding knowledge about trauma-informed practices and principles um, already, and it's such an important topic. Um, and kind of for me to keep continuing to root in the principles kind of in this work that can be um, sometimes really, you know, if I think about the ducks, right, like kind of very stress inducing, um, where we are also exposed, our young people and children and students and staff are exposed to trauma and stress, um, not only the those that we bring ourselves, but like in the workplace. So uh, we want to be able to root here. Sharing screen. 
And just our objectives and goals for today is to, um, and ongoingly, right, is to experience some safety, uh, re-regulation, and a deeper capacity to learn through mindfulness, uh, through facilitated peer connection and support, uh, thinking together, uh, learning together, and also problem solving together to really adopt and continuing to root and reroute in a trauma-informed approach um, that's shifting away from what's wrong, but really moving towards a uh, culturally responsive strength building um, where we are paying attention to uh, what is right, uh, what is going so incredibly well, right? And then how do we continue to uh, uh, remove barriers, right? To the inherent resiliency uh, that our community, young people, students, schools, uh, have. Uh, we want to implement trauma-informed practices in our respective environments and continue to become, and um, I would say to become or to continue, right, and being trauma-informed resiliency uh, champions of change in our workplaces and communities. And so just to start, right, this is the end or the middle of a work day for many of us. Um, and this is from Peter Levine. Um, actually, uh, they share kind of seven different handholds, but this is just an invitation. If it feels good to you to take a moment, feel your feet rooted on the ground, you can press your heels on the ground, you can feel your back for a moment, see if there's something holding you up or even just connecting to your spine. You can feel your head kind of going up towards the stars and the sky. And you can place a hand on your heart and on your belly. Feel the connection there. Even feel what it feels like to have your hand on your body if that feels comfortable. And then just invite us to take three breaths together. Inhaling and exhaling. And one last breath at your own pace. Right, we bring this, our body, our nervous systems, our hearts, our breath into the work. And so often we're like leaning out or connecting out and paying attention to what's around us through necessity, um, through our care. And it takes, you know, sometimes it's helpful to take a moment to come back into this, this vessel and this being, um, and our breath can help us to do that. So we have at this time, you know, all heard the phrase trauma-informed care, trauma-informed practices, systems, uh, appreciate Sean Jinwright's frame of healing-centered engagement. Um, and overall, like what this is, is really holding that there is stress and trauma um, in our environments, that we are kind of beings that impact one another um, and really wanting to shift from a perspective of looking at what's wrong and focusing on what's wrong uh, to bringing a focus of what has happened. And when we think about what has happened to that young person, when we think about what has happened to a community or to a population of folks um, or to a neighborhood, right? If we, when we hold what has happened, we see what is right. We see what is well, what is persistent. Um, we see, you know, we begin to see how actually amazing um, and to really root in and how much um, well-being uh, already exists. And from that focus, we can build in healing systems. Um, and, you know, for the purpose of the time we're spending today, we're looking, you know, more at our schools, right? And, you know, even thinking about for our school systems or for our school communities or school sites, what has happened? Um, and then how do we notice and focus on the strengths? from that place. Um, we are sharing Jack, Dr. Uh, Joy Dorado's, um, Joyce Dorado's uh, framework of a trauma-informed schools that it really is holding students at the center um, uh, and students, and then looking at the staff, caregivers and systems and leadership. That's the system that is created. Um, and these are the six principles that we're going to root in. I'll have take a moment for you to just take a snapshot and again, um, you may be familiar with this framework or for those who are entering the field, I know we have some trainees or some folks in the room as well, right? This may be the first time of kind of looking at this all together. So understanding trauma and stress 
without understanding trauma, um, and this is a continual process, right? We're more likely to misinterpret behavior. Um, and this may be the behavior of a student or a behavior of our colleague or a coworker or a teacher. Um, and we're more likely to actually re-traumatize or to do harm. Um, stress is something that we all need. Um, you know, we just as babies need stress to build their bones and walk, right? We kind of need stress for motivation, like an optimal level of stress. Um, and yet when um, we move to a place of, you know, stress kind of being overstressed or when there's stress and that um, is uh, moving to the continuum of trauma where there's a, a threat to someone's safety, to their well-being, um, to their health. And that's when we're kind of more on the spectrum of trauma. Uh, we all have a physiological response to trauma. So if we kind of open the hood, um, you know, it impacts our nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system, um, and our sympathetic nervous system. We have a place where we can kind of rest and digest or a place where we're on high alert. Um, and in our brains, right, we have our prefrontal cortex, but really thinks through things, uh, can be reflective, so it says, you know, should I do this or should I do that? Um, but when we are in a place of high acute stress or trauma, that kind of goes offline and our more, our amygdala uh, goes online, our limbic brain system um, that really goes into our fight, flight, or freeze, right? This is all things that you know, um, and I'm just reminding us of this. And what we're also holding that is trauma includes, you know, individual trauma, historical trauma, uh, environmental trauma. Um, what we're seeing it right now in terms of kind of the climate tragedies that are happening, as well as um, oppression. So the trauma of race and racism. You know, I was just in a suicide prevention training last week, um, and really holding the impact of racialized trauma and oppression um, as an indicator for uh, suicidal, as a potential indicator for suicidality. Um, so, uh, so what do we do, right? So we begin to understand it. We uh, learn about trauma con on a continuous basis. And, you know, the first step is really beginning to root in and recover. For one step in recovery is around reestablishing safety, safety and stability. And there's some ways that we can do this in our school systems by creating some predictability, um, reducing unnecessary changes. Actually, in the site that I'm sitting in right now, there was just a lockdown, but it was a drill. I don't know if I've had a lockdown drill before. I've been in many, many lockdowns, but it's like, oh, good. At least, you know, like there's a drill. So then like, everyone knows what to do um, when when there is a real one. Um, so, you know, having a sense of preparedness. Um, I think we see it when, you know, you go into a classroom and the teacher has the do now and also has kind of the agenda for the class and what's going to happen for that day. So that's, you know, one way of creating some safety and stability. Um, it's also creating safety in our physical environments, making sure that people know what, you know, the emergency protocols are, making sure that spaces are clean and safe and accessible and comfortable. Um, and then safety includes our so emotional safety, um, maintaining healthy interpersonal boundaries, managing conflict appropriately in our relationships. Um, I also talk to teachers often about, um, you know, being able to speak from an emotional place, right, in a way that can support students to create some emotional language. So many, many different ways of recreating safety and reestablishing physical safety social and emotional safety in a school environment. Um, another like anchor part of a trauma-informed system is cultural humility, uh, social justice and equity. Um, I'm just lifting up this quote by Kanwa Paul uh, Diwali from the Rice Center. If it's not racially just, it's not trauma-informed. And those are who are familiar with uh, Shan Jin Wright's healing-centered engagement. And he really said, you know, we can't you know, there are those trauma-informed principles or practices that don't root in cultural humility, equity, social justice, um, and again, holding um, where culture is a place of resilience, where culture is a place of wellness, um, and also where racism, oppression um, is a place of harm. And some ways that we do this, um, I'm, I'm looking at some of my colleagues that are here, I can't see you, but I know you're in the room, right, is having, you know, specific groups for, um, you know, Latinx immigrant students or for Black students, um, really having affiliation, um, 
creating safe spaces where people can come together and really designating our curriculum um, to different and specific populations um, so that we can leverage the resource that culture is uh, for our young people. I look forward to hearing some of the examples that you have uh, and that you all will share with us today. And then another principle of trauma-informed system is compassion and dependability. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm holding, you know, it, given the, the years that we have been through, right, is there's no better time than now to uh, root in compassion for ourselves um, and the way and for each other, uh, and also the way that dependability builds trust, right? Kind of the ways that we kind of keep showing up, or if we're not able to show up, we communicate um, with each other, you know, having the consistency, but also flexibility. One example as a school-based behavioral health provider is, you know, many systems have like no show rules, right? Like, oh, if the student doesn't show up for three times and you close that case and really holding like, okay, we want to have some consistency, um, but also when do we have flexibility and how do we create room for flexibility in that policy? Um, having integrity in our communication, um, you know, being where we say we're going to be or letting folks know if we're not able to be there or show up, um, really practicing repair and forgiveness and modeling that. Um, I'm so grateful for many of our schools that have a restorative justice practices. Um, and so these are some examples of, uh, you know, practicing compassion and dependability. Uh, one of the things at the beginning of our, uh, of the school year at one of our sites, um, there was a, young, a coach who died, um, had a huge impact on the whole school community. And what I really noticed um, was that the leadership of the school really focused on uh, allowing the students who were most impacted to really lead what they needed and the adults were there to support. And the students really did um, lead and let us know where they wanted to be. Um, they were able to share their own stories and really show so much compassion and care towards one another. And then lastly, we wanna like build resilience and social emotional well-being. Um, we uh, paying attention to the protective factors and you know looking at how do we build those protective factors. You know, one of the primary protective factors being relationship. Um, and I think everyone here does so much work to be in relationship with young people, but also to nurture and build the capacity of the folks, you know, those natural relationships of the parents, of the teachers, of the, you know, the godmother or the aunt um, or the um, father or the uncle, right? Like one of the things is in our job is to build and support those uh, protective factors. As we're also cultivating and supporting our own resilience, um, one of the things I put here is like kind of learning about soft culture. I was like, what's that? You know, like I'm going to have a generation of like grind, 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 go, 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 right? But beginning to like have the things that support our well-being as we're in this work and support our colleagues. We, uh, Lauren, Dr. Lauren Hack and I got to do a training for uh, Castamont teachers last year. And one of the things we did is created um, aromatherapy lotion, right? As part of, we taught about stress, we taught about trauma, um, but then we also taught about resilience and uh, had an activity. And it was so beautiful to see how the teachers really lit up um, to create their little aromatherapy lotions and to try out different scents and to have each other smell their scents, right? And so um, that's one way of building the resilience. Also, if folks are doing, um, again, building resilience with teachers, one of the nice things about this training, um, we did one for the all staff, but then we did one that really teachers got to opt in. Um, and so it was really beautiful to see them be a part of this. I want to just hold that, you know, we as a mental health practitioner, right, I, I'm, I'm holding um, trauma in one way um, and resilience and then also holding in the education field that there are ways that our part, our education partners are teaching social emotional learning um, throughout all the different grades, you know, from preschool all the way up to the 12th grade. And so one of the things we can continue to be curious about is where uh, the principles of social emotional learning, SEL, kind of intersect with the principles of a uh, trauma-informed school and trauma-informed systems. 
And lastly, like if we're like, okay, now what is a trauma informed approach? Like, you know, I know I hear this, I know I carry this, I know I've went through that. It is a system. This is from SAMHSA that you know realizes the the widespread impact impact of trauma and understands many potential paths for recovery. Um, that recognizes signs and symptoms of trauma in our clients, in our families, in our staff, in ourselves, and in the system and responds by fully integrating this knowledge into our policies, procedures, and practices. And we uh, seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. So I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Petra Steinbotel, just to see if there's anything that you'd like to add or to this. I think that's gonna stop sharing. Thank you. I just am just so excited to see everyone here and always appreciate hearing and learning from you, Santoy. And um, I'm wondering if, um, you know, if what aspects of this resonate with folks, how many folks here are engaged in kind of explicit trauma-informed learning in your respective settings? I can share if you want. Um, I'm a school nurse in Marin County and I uh, I work with special ed, but I'm getting my uh, school nurse credential right now. So I think we had a lecture not that long ago on trauma-informed care. And I was thinking about little things I could do. And I work in so many different classrooms that I just tried to set up a schedule so I would really be predictable. Like I show up at this class on Thursday and this class on Friday and try to show up when I say I'm going to show up. And at least, I mean, it seems like a really small thing, but you know, it's, it's kind of a start. Yeah. That predictability is so key to creating safety mm -hmm. and reliability and having routines and rhythms as part of our just innate need. Anyone else like to share? It's always hard to break the ice on Zoom, <laughs> um, but just want to really invite folks um, to jump in. There really is no such thing as a, a question that is, you know, inappropriate or um, or not welcome in any way, because we are here to learn from each other and support each other. I can go ahead and chime in, Russell. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I am actually a mental health clinician that provide educational related mental health services to students that have an IEP. And um, I think that I'm noticing just a trend of, of like the buzzword is trauma informed. Um, and so everyone strives to do that. But I think that where we're falling short is actually putting in the policies and procedures to ensure that we are actually being um, trauma informed and trauma informed intentionally within the processes that we do on a daily basis. So even though uh, I think that we in education understand the importance of making sure that we're being trauma informed, that we're putting in, you know, services appropriately, uh, I feel like we're falling short in um, the disconnect between the admin administration policies higher policies and what we're doing with direct services. And so I I um I guess my hope is that we we find a way to bridge the gap because um you know for the past 2 3 years we've been hearing about the second wave of the pandemic pandemic is going to be mental health. And um right now we're noticing much more the impacts of what that looks like. You know, we have a lot of this regular students, they're getting younger and younger that they're cleaning out, clearing out classrooms. And there's a lot of dysregulation. There's a lot of burnout within staff and then we're understaffed as well. So um, what I'm noticing now is that we're joining in in the trauma in different levels. And then we're magnifying the the vulnerability that we had post, post uh, COVID and post everything else that has transpired within that. So what I'm seeing is a community general in trauma and um, policies and procedures ill-fitted to catch up to what's going on right now. And so just trying within the field, we're just trying to do it in silo because we have to sustain, but at the same time, we're seeing it. 
kind of crumble all around us. So it's, um, yeah, it's really difficult when you know, or you feel like you've, you've done your homework to get trained to figure out what trauma looks like and what it manifests into and how it can affect and impact our organizations and the students that we provide services to. Um, but it's, Rina, we're not catching thank, up. Thank yeah, Rena, thank you so much. I, I'm sure we can all relate to many elements of what you're saying. And, um, you know, it's, it's so hard when we have a system that involves, you know, even more than one person that there's going to be misses, right? And there's going to be ways that it ends up being trauma inducing instead of trauma informed. And, um, and so want to invite us to think about kind of the um, the objectives for the session and for the learning that we're doing here. We appreciate that Project Echo has a really, um, like the capacity to have us join here together from really all over the state. And um, and that part of this is um, trying to find those small um, and large ways that we can be the champions of change in our respective systems and knowing, you know, that um, that these kinds of forces are always at work um, and, you know, that we want to be able to create as much safety as we can. Um, and I'm going to copy those objectives and put them in the chat as soon as I them. This is a friendly re reminder if, um, to put ourselves on mute if we're um, if we're not explicitly talking, but um, I'm wondering if we want to go ahead and uh, think about the case presentation. Absolutely. So let me just share a little bit about how we're structuring our case-based learning today and for the next nine months. Um, so we are going to use a model called ecstasis, which is Greek for to stand outside of oneself. And we've started using this model in our school and school-based health center echoes because we found it really fits well with the objectives that we have and allows us to be reflective. It's really interactive and learner-centric, emotionally engaged. And it is a bit structured because what we know is we're inherent philosophers. We tend to jump to giving advice before we really thoroughly understood what's going on. And when we're receiving advice, we tend to yes, but, right? I know at least I do. And so the ecstasis model is deliberately structured to try and prevent those sort of natural things from happening. I'm gonna really briefly show a video describing the ecstasis model. One method of peer consultation is called the ecstasis model. The ecstasis model is designed to be reflective, learner-centric, interactive, and emotionally engaged. The ecstasis model can help generate ideas, bolster support, and may even improve the outcomes of those we work with. How does an ecstasis consultation work? First, someone from the team presents a case to the rest of the group. This could be something you're stuck on or something that's contributing to burnout. Next, the group asks the presenter fact-based questions. This is not yet time to problem solve. Next, the presenter silently steps back and observes the team conducting diagnostic brainstorming. Finally, the team moves on to brainstorming action steps for solutions. This is when problem solving occurs. In the last step, the presenter joins back in to provide reflections. Okay, so... You know, what we've heard from doing these in in these echoes and also consultation with other school and school-based health centers over the years is that people really feel validated and held and supported when they're bringing 
a, a problem or a question to the team. Um, it helps us feel connected and part of a community, even if the experiences we're sharing are, are challenging. Um, and because most of the, the lift is actually done by the people not asking the question, it can feel a little bit less burnout inducing than traditional case presentations where you feel like you really have to prepare and, and it takes a lot to just get ready for it. We're hoping to make this as low burden as possible so that people can come to the group and get help without having to put a bunch of work in ahead of time. So this is how the structure kind of looks. We can adjust the timing today since we had a little bit more introduction for the echo. Someone uh, from our team, we're gonna ask in just a moment if someone would volunteer to share something they're stuck on with a student, a group of students, just like more in general in your setting. And then we as a team have the chance to ask clarifying questions. Then the person will actually mute themselves, turn their screen off and observe as we kind of try and first figure out, well, what do we all hear that's going on? And then lastly, what are some recommendations we might offer? Um, these agreements for consultation are borrowed from the DBT team agreements. And really we think they're important to, you know, highlight that there's no big T truth. There's no right answer. Um, what we're really trying to do is, is look for things that we might be leaving out and bring all of our different perspectives, celebrating diversity and change. Um, we really want to come at this with a non-judgmental stance, right? We're all here volunteering our time in our busy days because we want to be improving. Um, and we all have room for improvement, right? So we're coming to the space knowing that we're all coming in from different levels and we all have room to grow from each other and stretch our limits, right? We're probably going to have some unfinished business. There's likely going to be unsolved answers at the end of the 25 minutes and we all make mistakes and it's okay to point those out. Um, and it's, it's okay to point out when one of these agreements feels like it's not being upheld. Any questions or thoughts about the the model and would anybody like to volunteer to bring bring a question to the team 